this was a joke the entire season to think it wasn't going to happen. But our lady, our woman, our hooper, Caitlin Clark, is the unanimous, no kidding, rookie of the year. Was it ever really a competition? I mean, seriously, I get that Angel Reese hung on and is hanging on for dear life to Caitlin Clark. I mean, she is trying and... Well, because of DEI, we got to get her out there. We got to get her on the cover of Sports Illustrated. We don't want anybody saying we're racist. So you got to talk about Angel Reese. Angel Reese's team stunk. She really wasn't very good other than rebounding. But I'm not even talking about Angel Reese. Let's talk about the person who got what she deserved. The first team WNBA. Well, how about that in your rookie year? In your rookie year, all the hate going on yesterday, that idiot Carrington poked her in the eye. I don't know whether it was on purpose or not, but I know a lot of players, myself included, that knew how to do that on purpose if you wanted to. She is the rookie of the year. Let's look at all of the accolades given to Caitlin Clark. Unanimous rookie of the year. Seriously. Like, we told you way back that the betting markets had taken Caitlin Clark, Caitlin Clark, WNBA Rookie of the Year off the board. Like, there was no Caitlin Clark, WNBA Rookie of the Year, minus 100, 200. There was none because this was the easiest thing ever, ever. All WNBA first team. Now, here's what I like about it. You know what I like about it? Didn't start that way. One and nine. Didn't start that way at all. And I got to tell you, it certainly finished that way. Now, they're going to get swept in the playoffs. They got beat. Connecticut Sun got them game one. They're going to get beat. They're not quite there yet. But the only reason they're in the playoffs is because of that lady right there. Now, having sent all that, first team all WNBA, huh? Wonder if a first team all WNBA player should make the Olympic team if the OGs, the crazy ass lesbians, the crazy ass OGs, the crazy ass sexist racists, of the WNBA that did not make the WNBA anywhere notable over 27 years, hadn't been so jealous, hadn't been so hateful, hadn't been so exclusive as opposed to inclusive, hadn't been, frankly, so ridiculous. Let's hearken. I'm hearkening today. There is hearkening. I'm hearkening back to when Angel Reese's teammate, Kennedy Carter, knocked Angel Reese, cheapest of all cheap shots, and what did Angel Reese and her teammates do? They celebrated it. Now, they can all sit there and call out others. Remember the democratic liberal way. Call out others for what you are doing. They're talking about racism of Caitlin Clark's fans. Huh. I think that Angel Reese and those claiming racism among Caitlin Clark's fans are actually the ones participating in the racism by celebrating an assault on the court. But I digress. This is not the time for that. Caitlin Clark finished fourth. We told you this was going to happen, too. We told you by the end of the year she would be a serious contender for the WNBA MVP award. Say that three times. She wasn't going to win. Asia Wilson, America's most immature star, most immature MVP, was going to win. But she did get, let's see, six third-place votes, 26 fourth-place votes, 22 fifth-place votes. That's pretty good. Nah, it's really good. So, what does this all mean? Well, it means that guys like Gina Oriema and others, Diana Taurasi, that said she was going to get her to come up, it's weren't exactly right. See, you got to watch the actual game, and you got to watch it with unbiased. That's why I've become the most popular talk show host in the history of talk radio and now streaming. Because I watch the game without bias, and I tell you what the hell is going to happen. People say I hate... People say I love. No, I just watch, give you my reaction. It's what smart people do. And I got to tell you, this show is nothing if not smart. You know, Nick and I on uh, Monday will wear black. We'll celebrate our team's wins, our losses, whatever. But this show's smart. We are without bias. No bias. Zero bias. We would actually love the OG, lesbian, sexist, racist, WNBA women if they hadn't been exactly what I just said. We would love them. We're all in on it. Nobody talks about the WNBA more than us, but we just call it what it is. All right, we'll go back to this. Season's over. Indiana, regular season attendance records. Listen to this. This is a bit stunning to me. Although, although, well, no, there is no although. I wrote down an although, but I'm not even going to give you an although because as I looked at it, I thought to myself, there is no although. This should never happen. 
except for Caitlin Clark. The Fever averaged 4,066, excuse me, in attendance last year. This year, 17,035. The Pacers averaged 15,6 last year. This year, 16,528. They beat the Pacers. This is a basketball state now. We'll go to basketball games. We like basketball. We don't really attend high school basketball games. People think we do, but that's a farce. We don't anymore. But the long story of it, or the short, the long and the short of it, is I cannot believe if you've lived in this state, there is no chance that you would ever, and I mean ever, thought that the fever, who are literally, I'm telling you, two years ago when I had my fir- other radio show in Indy, I went the entire summer. Now think about summers in Indiana. There is no football. Well, you know what I mean. There is no baseball. I went the entire summer and did not know the Fever played a game. Did not mention the Fever until the season was over, and my producer said, hey, Dan, did you know the Fever's last game was yesterday? That's two years ago. Now, last year during the Fever season, I didn't do a show. This year, it's all I talk about because it's interesting. It's fascinating. It's fun. Fever's average attendance higher than five NBA teams. Hornets, Pacers, Grizzlies, Hawks. No, seriously. Now, I don't know if it's going to happen again next year. I'm fascinated. Here's why. Pacers made a nice run, and Tyrese Halliburton is starting to ingrain himself into the community. He's at everything. He's showing out. He's Mr. Happy. And we'll see if this whole fever thing lasts. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. But I got to tell you, for this year, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm totally serious about this, if you asked anybody, and I, I, even the dumbest of the dumb here, in the media in the great state of Indiana. Would you ever see a day where the Indiana Fever outdrew the Pacers? They would laugh at you. They would. This is the effect of Caitlin Clark. Now, I don't have the merchandise sales here, but there is nobody in any sport right now. Now, by the way, Harrison Butker in the NFL has surpassed Travis Kelsey's Jersey sales, which is interesting. Tells you a little bit about where the middle of the country is going. But there is nobody. On this, I can't even express to you enough how down and out the Fever's franchise was. They couldn't give a ticket away. They don't, I don't even think they were ever on TV. If they were, I didn't watch. I couldn't tell you the radio station. That has fever games, if any do. Couldn't tell you a sponsor. Couldn't tell you a player. There was a girl named Bevel Aqua. I just thought her name was cool, but I don't know if she's been there three years, five years, ten years. And all of a sudden, you've got a first-team all-WNBA player that is beyond in style anything we've seen in basketball. And people have responded to it. And I don't know why. Honestly, I don't know why. If you said to me, here is why Caitlin Clark hit so big, Isaiah said it really well. She has that it factor. I get all that. A lot of people have the it factor when you meet them. But the it factor for her, the only thing I can figure is she's got a little nastiness to her. She's got a little temper. Got a little down and dirty to her when she gets technical fouls. Plays the way everybody likes to play now, meaning she's a little bit flashy. She shoots from deep. I don't know. And she handles everything beautifully. While those around her, mostly men, act like complete starstruck dumbasses see Greg Doyle. I'm just telling you, it is one of the most fascinating things. People say, well, why do you keep talking about it? Because I'm fascinated by it. We've seen football. We've seen college football. We love both. By the way, the NFL is kind of sucking. I saw something Jonathan Hutton did, and I agree with him. It can't pass. I mean, the game yesterday, the Colts and the Bears, was awful. But I'm telling you, even though the second half of the Sun Fever game was awful, there's something drawing you to watching it. Ah, it's amazing. It really is amazing. And I cannot state strongly enough how improbable that number right there, 17,035 people. 16,528. I can't tell you how improbable that is in the state of Indiana. For fever attendance, 
based are bigger than the Pacers. Congratulations, Lynn Dunn. Congratulations to all the folks with the fever, Christy Sides, and of course, Caitlin Clark. You know, the other day when I heard Adam Schefter making it sound like, well, Woj, Adrian Wojnarowski was digging ditches. Oh my God, the tough life of an insider, suckling at the teat of many, many players, all players, all GMs, and how hard it was, and how he wanted his life back. OMG, I can't believe how hard this life is. So he left millions on the table to go be the general manager of the St. Bonnie basketball team, his beloved Bonnies. Good for Woj. Good move. Look, a white dude, I've said this before, unless you really have an it, you get tired. You get tired of sitting there at ESPN with all the stupid. And, I mean, there is so much stupid. There is so much stupid in the, well, in the background, in the green room, sitting there listening to these idiot women who just can't, I mean, it's awful. The arrogance, the freaking drama. So Woj's probably like, yeah, I don't need it. Now, I don't know how often he goes there, but it ain't like he had this tough job. And what does he need, load management for a million-plus-dollar-a-year job? To tell you what other people are doing? Oh, shut up. Well, a lot of people criticized me. A lot of people were on my ass about it. Bill Simmons was not one of those. Bill Simmons sees exactly what I'm talking about. He takes aim at Adam Schefter over his overly dramatic, oh, my God, portrayal of Adam, or uh, of, of uh, Woj's retirement. Let's hear. Let's hear from uh, Simmons. You can't overreact after Adrian Wojnarowski retires either, like Adam Schefter did. He wanted his life back. He didn't want to have to work on holidays. He didn't want well, to have to be away from more family gatherings. I will say this. He didn't I, want I, to take a shower with your phone up against the shower door so you could see a text that's coming in. Or take your phone with you to the urinal and hold it in one hand while you take care of your business in the other. That's the life we live. This is the this thing Adam Schefter said on television. What is is Andrew Wojnarowski? Was he an ER doctor during that during uh, COVID? I, I I wasn't sure. The phone in the shower could go a lot of different ways. I mean, oh my imagine? god, the Charlotte GM's texted me. I got to hold this piss. What what happened yesterday? What was that? I uh, honest to God. Like, I like Bill Simmons' books. I haven't really paid attention to Bill Simmons. I don't know where to find him, but he's right. Like, what, what is this guy, saving lives? Was he on call 12, 14, 20 hours a day to rush out? I got a friend. I got a friend. True story. I got a friend that's a fireman. He told me the other day, he goes, hey, Dan, probably the worst area in India is about 38th and Post Road. It's about, I don't know, five miles, three miles that way. He goes, hey, we got called around 36th and Post Road, a house, boarded up. We go in. It's an overdose. He goes in. He goes, Dan, this dude's ODing, but all these guys are rich white dudes that hate from Carmel that are here for sex parties and drugs. And he goes, we get in there, and not only do we got to save one guy, we got like three or four. But nobody wants to go to the hospital because they don't want their rich wives and their suburban communities to know that they engage in sex and drugs in this house. Now, that's a bad movie. He goes, Dan, I swear to God, I wanted to wear a hazmat suit. What the hell was going on here? Could tell dudes just got off work, they're in their suits, and there's young boys, and there's all this craziness here. Now that's a hard job. Now that's, and, and he's like, hey, we, I don't know what the hell, but we had to save a bunch of dudes' lives that I don't even know if they're worth saving. As crazy as these people are. Now that's a hard job. Really? Okay. Hey, uh, don't tell Shams. All right, I got this one. Oh, okay, bye. Oh my God, could you imagine? Uh, Jamal, it be Joel Embiid is going to sign for 150 million. Oh my God! Oh jeez! Well, I don't know what the hell they do as a general manager of St. Bonnie basketball, but I know this: I'll put up what I did at Bowling Green in terms of getting up at seven in the morning, never being around, having to rush out, go see a kid's game, get back to the office, get back. I don't know, home 10, 11 o'clock, do it again the next day. I'll put that up against being an information guy. And then whether you win or lose is on you.
Now, I get it. There is a competitive nature there. I mean, how's Woj going to handle the competitive nature of being on a bench or behind a bench of a college team if he couldn't handle the competitive nature of him against Shams? <laughs> oh, my God. These guys, everybody's got every – here's the deal, all right? Everybody, and I mean everybody, wants to be a coach. They want to live the life or act like they live the life of a coach. Getting up at 7 in the morning, busting your ass. They do. All these guys around sports want to think about being, how can I equate? Jay Billis does it every day. Jay Billis acts like he's some coach. Never coach blind turkeys, take a dump. All these guys do, and I like Jay. But all these guys do. They all try to act like they're coaches. Adam Schefter. I got gas. I lift the cheek. Nah, let's lift the cheek, Aaron. I lift the cheek to you, Schefter, for making this job so dramatic. Okay, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll send a basket of flowers. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll send a edible arrangement. Hey, man, thanks for the information. Uh, Tyrese Halliburton is going to sign a three-year deal. Oh, man, it's tough work. Oh, God. Get to the computer. Shut the f- up. Try going into a crack house with a bunch of dudes dead. Anyway, Jimmy Johnson, well, he, uh, I don't know why he's still on TV. Is he sober? I think he's sober, and I like Jimmy Johnson. I know why he's on TV. Why? Well, I got to be careful here because I just realized I think he's on Fox. So Jimmy Johnson's awesome at what he does. He went off. This I like. This is why you're on TV. See, when you watch the NFL shows, nobody says nothing. They just giggle. What's that guy's name, Nate Burleson? All he does is giggle and interrupt. I was watching the show, I hope this isn't on Fox, with J.J. Wright, Nate Burleson. I don't know who the hell was on this set. Maybe Matt Ryan. All he did was giggle and talk over people and act clever. That's why when people say to me, hey, wouldn't you love to be at Thanksgiving dinner with J.J. Watt? And so- no. No, I want to go to Thanksgiving dinner with my beautiful wife, uh, Halle Berry, uh, Elizabeth Hurley. Yeah. I want to hear their stories. I don't want to giggle. Anyway, sometimes I get off track. But Jimmy Johnson went off on the Carolina Panthers owner, David Tepper. Yeah, it's the owner's fault. Can't be the player's fault. The owner of the Panthers, that's the problem. He's got to listen to his football people and quit playing fantasy football. Really? Okay. I don't know. Let's hear from Jimmy Johnson. Of the NFL, and he will. But why has he had all these coordinators and all these head coaches? The owner of the Carolina Panthers, that's the, you know, that's the problem. He's making the major decisions without listening to his football people. Tepper. David Tepper. You look at him. And now it's his team. He can do whatever he wants to. But look at the people that's left. Now, he's the one that wanted Bryce Young as the number one pick. And also look at Christian McCaffrey, D.J. Moore, Brian Burns. You look at, you know, Baker Mayfield. He's making the decisions. He has got to listen to his football people and quit playing fantasy football. How do you deal with it as a head coach, then, if you've got an owner who's not listening to your football people? Can they ever turn it around there as long as he's the owner? You keep getting beat, and you're going to say, hey, wait a minute, I may not be doing it right. I better listen to somebody that's been doing it his entire life. I don't think that's how he works. He's $8 billion worth money. $20 billion. $20 billion. Oh, 20. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Twenty billion. Yeah, he could care less. Yeah, but no. he he's got to listen to his football people. They've been doing it every day of their life. You know, I, I was told one time, Jimmy, you go to bed at night thinking about football. You wake up in the morning thinking about football. Well, that's what these people that are trying to advise him are doing. Listen to them. Uh, Thirty-six twenty-two. That's what. Andy Dalton was able to do yesterday for the Carolina Panthers over the Oakland Raiders or the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, Bryce Young hadn't thrown a touchdown pass since Christmas Eve of last year. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, it's kind of fascinating to me. It actually is very fascinating. It's never the player's fault. You know what I mean? Like, it's never anymore the player's fault. I, I get it. It's like the mafia. The owner wanted Bryce Young. So we got to blame the owner, or at least that's what everybody says. I don't know if that's true or not. But it's never the player's fault. I mean, I, I, you know, I saw a bunch of tweets yesterday saying, hey, look, I think they brought Andy Dalton in just to show that Bryce Young is ass. I love that saying, by the way. Hey, he's just ass. 
anyway, why isn't it Bryce Young's fault? I, I don't I don't know. But it never is. It's never the player anymore. It's always the system, the owner. It's never, hey, look, man, this dude sucks. This dude really, really sucks. Well, he's the guy throwing it. He's the guy checking out of it. He's the guy reading it. But it's always somebody else. I tell you where it may be somebody else. Nick and I were talking about this earlier. It may be always somebody else when it's with, when it's the Bears. I mean, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Justin Fields is absolutely balling as he got away from Eberflus. Didn't we tell you folks in Chicago about Eberflus? I think we did. Uh, apparently, the Panthers have rejected trade offers from four teams for Bryce Young. Think about that. Wait a second. Bryce Young must have talent because Jay Glazer is reporting that they've rejected trade offers for Bryce Young. Yeah, I don't know about if I'm trading him just yet. See, here's the deal. All right, Jimmy Johnson was just talking about his football people. Well, the football people are working with him every day in the building. The quarterback coach, the offense coordinator, the head coach, blah, 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 blah. All the people are working with him every day in the building. So they know whether he is good enough or whether he is not good enough. And Canales comes in, and he has to make that evaluation. And if Canales comes in, he's the coach, and is smart, and he makes the evaluation that the guy can't play, then you trade him. If you make the evaluation the guy can't play, then you sit, you let him learn, and you let him see what's going on. But I got to tell you, that was a different offensive team. 36 points, are you kidding me? I've always wondered this. I've always wondered, how does a rookie, like, think about a guy like Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton comes in the league. He's been in the league a pretty long time. He's been pretty good. Not great, pretty good. How does a rookie come in and all of a sudden is better than an Andy Dalton? Better at reading, better at reacting. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I always am fascinated by it. Look, I get it. Peyton Manning's in there. He's the number one pick. He's got all his talent. Andrew Luck. I get it. John Elway, all the greats. But I always wondered that. How are they just immediately better? Like, I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. But in this case, uh, the old man, (laughs) Andy Dalton, got her done. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to break down this week's OutKick Top 20. Brought to you by HIMS. Yes, HIMS. Healthcare designed for you and delivered to your door. I like HIMS. Uh, Our beautiful panel of OutKick voters decided who they believe earned their place in the top 12, the top 12 teams in college football. Let's start off with the top 12 rankings after week four. You guys ready? Uh, Top 12, Texas, Georgia, Oklahoma. No, no, no. Texas, Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, Ole Miss, Tennessee. What? Miami, Oregon. Utah, Penn State, Missouri, and Boise State. All right. We're putting in a number 12, I believe, a team outside of the top, you know, the power five. Texas, Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Miami, Oregon, Utah, Penn State, Missouri, and Boise. Here's each voter's top pick. My top pick was Texas. I'm not going to lie to you. I think Texas is great. Basically, everybody's top pick. Clay's top pick. Boy, if you can read that, God bless you. Clay's top pick is Texas. Will Kane, Texas. Ricky Cobb, Texas. Kelly Stewart, Texas. Chad Withrow, Texas. Jonathan Hutton, Texas. Trey Wallace, Texas. Lou Holtz, Texas. Les Miles, Georgia. Senator Tommy Tuberville, Texas. Brock Hewitt, Texas. Tim Brando, Texas. Janine Edwards, Texas. Now, that's a hell of a poll. I mean, that is one great poll right there. I got Texas, Ohio State, Tennessee, Georgia, Ole Miss, Alabama, Miami, Oregon, Penn State. Look who I got down there. See me? I'm below Clay. See me right there? Indiana or Indiana. Doesn't anybody else have Indiana? Is there nobody else paying attention? Is anybody else on this poll know football but me? What are we doing? Nobody knows football but me. I'm the only one that knows football. No, I don't. Uh, real quick, Nick, who would you have as the number one team? Uh, probably Texas. Although I'm a little biased because I yeah. like Tennessee. So I'd probably put them like closer to two, three, but it's, uh, it's absolutely Texas. 
Yeah, I mean, you go in and you beat Oklahoma at Oklahoma, and Oklahoma thought they were pretty good. I'm with you, man. That's pretty good for Tennessee. That's why I put Tennessee as as hard as I as high as I did. Because look, hey, don't at me, people. Tennessee pretty damn good. Nico Horner is great. I know it's not Nico Horner, but that's what I'm calling him. Yeah, I'm with. I was going to say Nico right. Horner is your shortstop. <laughs> Second baseman for the Cubs. Second baseman. Dansby Swanson is our shortstop, who, by the way, got hot when the season was over. Dansby Swanson sucked, and now all of a sudden he's hitting 1,000 because the season's over. I got two words for Dansby Swanson. Lift the cheek. Anyway, here's what the college football playoffs would look like in our poll if the season ended today. Top seed gets a bye. That's Texas. Second seed gets a bye. Georgia. Third seed gets a bye. Ohio State. Fourth seed, Bama. Bye. Now, the first games would be fun, I think. Ole Miss, the fifth seed. That's right. Taking on. Wait, that's not what it would be. Fifth seed. You guys got, I got Ole Miss here as a fifth seed. You guys got Georgia as the fifth seed. Taking on Boise. What did I do wrong? Oh. Oh, it's conference champs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, conference champs. Oregon against Tennessee, the 9-8-9 nine, nine game. Boy, that would be a great second-round game if Tennessee got in there. Boise, that's right, conference champions. Taking on Georgia. Taking on Georgia, winner takes on Utah. That's the best route. I don't think Utah's great. Then we got Penn State, Alabama Slamma. Boy, what a classic game that is. Winner goes to Miami. And then Missouri Ole Miss, winner goes and plays Ohio State. What a great – that's a Rose Bowl. Look at that. We've actually gotten smart enough to put bowl games in there. I've said this for years. The Sugar Bowl, the Fiesta, Fiesta forever, Peach Bowl, Rose Bowl, Cotton Bowl, Orange Bowl. That's right. Look at us being smart. Huh. Uh, Indiana, however – is going to make their way in. They've had a great schedule, easy. They smoked big old fat Biff Pogey. Remember Biff Pogey at Charlotte? He's the guy that was cheating these nuts off with Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. Then he left, and he made this big impassioned plea on cheating ass Jim Harbaugh. So it didn't bother me even a little bit that my boys, who seemingly, by the way, have a tough group coached by a tough guy, huh, also athletic and fast, beat the living dog out of Charlotte and Biff Pogey. Good for Indiana. Tennessee and Nico Nico takes down Oklahoma in Norman. Now, remember, this is Oklahoma. I mean, I saw a video of Brent Venables running the stairs before the game. Oh, my God, harumph, harumph, harumph. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Watch your ass. Anyway, he's running the stairs, so we got to root for him. Nah, man, oh, man. USC had chances. They were getting their brains beat out. They had shot, then they didn't. Michigan got them done, got it done. At home, big win. Sharon Moore, don't like to see it. Great, great banner outside a fraternity house. The quarterback for Michigan's last name is Orgy, O-R-J-I. A fraternity house said, not enough condoms for this orgy. See what they did there? Mm. Sexist. But against who? Men or women? I don't know. Last I looked, unless you're getting monkeypox, both men and women participate in orgies. So it's not sexist. By the way, I never have. It's not my thing. Colorado overtime thriller. I mean, they went deep. Go deep, got one-on-one coverage. Shadour Sanders delivered it, and my toes were tapping because I took Colorado, gave the money or, or gave the points early, or took the points early when they were down. That's right. And next thing you know, Colorado got it done. What did I tell you about Colorado? What did I tell you? The second half of the game against Nebraska, Colorado got better. Colorado got tougher. Colorado's defense got stouter. You guys told me, oh, they got their ass kicked. No, no, no. I told you I'm believing a little bit here in Coach Prime. I'm believing in what's going down in B-Town. That's right, Boulder. I do. I believe in what's going down in Indiana, and I believe what's going down in Boulder. I do. Indiana's 4-0, by the way. Have I mentioned that? Wait, which shoulder? This one. There you go. 
Just saying, I don't know if we have it here, and I'm glad we don't, but Indiana basketball, my God. We got a little Jay, we got a little uh Justin Bieber P. Diddy vibe with this kid Galloway and this other kid Gabe Cubs dancing like I don't know what the hell they're dancing like. Nick Saban did not hold back. He did not hold back when discussing playing games at Vandy. Hmm. And that irked Loudmouth uh, Skip Bayless to the point where he stated he is ashamed Vanderbilt is slumming in the SEC with a school like Alabama Slamma. Here is what Nick Saban had to say about Vandy. I get in. But the only place you play in the SEC that's not hard to play is Vanderbilt. Because when you play at Vanderbilt, you have more fans there than they have. And that's no disrespect to them. It's, not just, a, it's just the truth. When we played in Nashville, we had more fans, Alabama fans, than what they had Vanderbilt fans. Yeah, hey, Nashville's a great city to go visit, too. You know, it's like the Vegas in the Midwest. So if there's an away game, it's certainly a good place to kind of go take a weekend trip to. We'll go watch uh, Alabama do their thing to a football team. We'll get great seats because there's going to be a lot available. And then we'll do Nashville, too. What a win. I didn't even think about that. Vandy's working against a couple different things there. Uh, one of them is interest in their football team. But it's coming back. Yeah. It's coming back. Oh, yeah. I wish he'd let, I wish they'd let Saban talk about it. I do. I, I wish they'd let Saban talk uh, about it. I do. I mean, let why? What? What's it like? Instead of you know, we all know Nashville's a great city and rah rah rah. Come on, you got to let the coach talk about why. Anyway, uh, here is <laughs> here's Skip Payless. All right, Nick Saban just stated the obvious. My school is the easiest place to play in SEC in football. Not in baseball. Not in golf. I don't know really. Not in golf. Uh, not in uh, but in football. I'll give you that because he's back to football factory juggernauts with those huge traveling fan bases. Yeah, they probably have more fans. Buy out tickets at Vandy. Then we'll have a football game. But, hey, when it comes to academics, when it comes to quality of education, the rest of the SEC isn't even in our league. When it comes to admission requirements, my school, Vandy, the best school in America, is slumming. To be in the SEC with the Alabamas of the world, it actually makes me ashamed. Well, it shouldn't make you ashamed, but you are right. Oh, you're absolutely right. Look, Alabama is not a hard place to get into. But they have up their academics, Georgia. All these state schools, you're absolutely right. Same thing with Northwestern and the Big Ten. I mean, let's be honest. Stanford in the old Pac-12. Hey, you got a breath? Could I, can you breathe on a phone? And does it fog up? You can get in Arizona, Arizona State. What, are you kidding? Cal, not so much. Stanford, not so much. Hey, wait a second. Let me see. Yep, there's fog there. You can get into Oregon, Oregon State, Alabama, sure, Georgia, of course, South Carolina, why not? No question. I mean, look, if you don't think you can't get in Oklahoma, hey, look, turn around, let me see. Are you an adult? Let me touch. Wait, I touched your arm. You're not AI. You're in. No, nah, he's right. He's absolutely right. So what? I like their football. All right, Nick. Where's my man Nick? Nick is in the house. Hey, Chiefs beat. Wait, where's he going? He's gone. He's leaving. He's out of here. Chiefs beat the Falcons. I didn't like it because I took the Falcons getting three. I did against the sack man's advice. Man, the Falcons had two opportunities for back-to-back last-second down the field wins, and they didn't get it done. That's not great. Ravens take down the Cowboys. Where's Nick? Cowboys made a hell of a comeback. I mean, one hell of a comeback. They were getting their ass beat. They had a chance late, couldn't get a stop on third down, and the Ravens got her dude. Rams upset the 49ers. Didn't see this one coming. The sack man had it, though. Sack man did have it. Rams got it done. I talked about Andy Dalton. I talked about Andy Dalton and the Panthers. I did. Panthers crushed Antonio Pierce. Antonio Pierce said after the game, a lot of guys on our team made business decisions. So now we're going to make a business decision when we watch the film. 